So, Alistair, over to you. Um, okay. Right. First of all, I suppose everyone can hear me. Um, and we'll start at the beginning uh, because that's usually the best place to start. Um, Come on, there we go. Right, firstly, I introduce those who don't know me. Well, I'm the chap who does all your returns. Most of the time I'm sending you annoying emails, um, requesting all kinds of things, including your inside leg and your shoe size and everything else. Um, to be honest, <laughs> when I first started doing this, there was about probably 150 to 200 returns a year. Nowadays, I'm facing more like uh, 2,500. To give you an idea, Last year we had 2,000, so we got 500 extra returns this year for our various clients alone. Um, it just shows that they're growing exponentially. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, uh, not only that, but um, that they, they're creating more and more different types of returns and specific to your firm. So it's a bit difficult to actually cover everything because some firms won't be doing the same returns as others, although they're covering the same content. So what I'm trying to do is cover the content rather than a specific uh, return. I'll use the RMA uh, mainframe because those tend to show it as clearly as possible. The FSA and ICARA seem to get themselves lost in rhetoric. Um, so I, I, I try to keep it as, as plain and simple as possible. Right. So there, um, what we're trying to do on this is, is become blatantly aware that the FCA have started to actually look at all the returns you've been doing for years now i know that sounds strange but up till sort of two years ago these were there to show that they were doing something the problem is that obviously they didn't pick anything up because if you're south of nick leeson you're just going to lie um <laughs> if you've not got what you need you, you put in what the fca want to hear and the system itself won't pick it up um however Within those, the last couple of years, because of FSCS, really, um, the, the FCA started to interactively look at the returns. So if you pop up for any reason in a return, you go to a window where they look at anything else you're doing. They may look at your complaints. They may look at uh, your finances. Whatever they're looking at, you start to be, they, they, they build a picture of you. And so the core picture actually starts here, where they're looking at, and what they're looking at, uh, it all starts here. And that's why in some ways you have to begin to change the way you do this, the way you interact with it, because it becomes more important. Um, some people don't do that. Some people kind of do that. And some directors actually run their compliance via this. So they use this as a starting point to check their companies. Um, however you do it, we adapt to it. Um, you know, we're not here to tell you exactly how to do your job. We're here to help you do the job. Um, I think that's a very important thing because quite often people may may uh, <laughs> may want to change change your mind about how you should do these. And what's important is that you understand that it's actually your decision on how these are submitted. If you want it one way, you want it another way, you tell us. We do it. We're not here to tell you that you're doing it wrong. Um, we would just say that this is probably a preference way of doing it. So bear in mind, it's very interactive with us. Um, other people will tell you exactly how you should do it, regardless of whether you think it's right or wrong. So there is a subtle difference in how we do that. And that's really because we're a consultant more than a, a, a network. Um, right. So I think we should move on to the next slide, which is really what we're going to try and cover today. Now. It's a bit loose because some of the areas um, we're, we're discussing will cover multiple firms and multiple types of firm. So um, I have left potentially some time to have a chat at the end to go through it. However, you know I'm here pretty much um, nine to five, um, more likely seven till seven. Um, so if you do need to ask a specific question, it's probably better to come directly to me afterwards. Uh, or if you can ask in the questions afterwards, that'd be great as well. Um, so our primary goals, we're going to cover some, what we think the FCA are doing, what they check, the, the immediate things you need to know. Um, then we're going to look at what the FCA think of how you're doing your return, what we think is important, what they think is important, what keeps the FCA happy. Then a sort of timeline. Now, this is a, a, 
a bit of a, I would say a bit of a mess on my behalf, but it kind of gives you a picture of how the FCA are thinking. Um, it won't make any sense to you, but I'll try and talk around it so it does. Right, and finally, we will actually go through some of the reports, most of the important reports. Um, I apologize if we missed some of them, but some people will have reports that others won't, and I'm trying to cover as much as I can in the time I'm given. Okay, so our primary goals. Well, the first thing I'd probably say is a deeper understanding of what the FCA are looking for and what you're required to provide. I think the FCA nowadays are expecting a lot more from these returns than they used to. They, As I said, it was a very much an automated process where if you went over a certain tolerance, it would kick a, a message to someone who would look at it. Um, nowadays, if your company's under scrutiny, they'll be looking at your returns anyway. Um, they will be using them as evidence against you. So it becomes a lot more serious when, uh, when you're doing these because the FCA are beginning to use them as their matrix for a semi-automated way of reviewing you. So they also use other areas. I mean, they're beginning to use surveys and, and conversations and, and all other areas to affirm what you're putting in your returns. So it's more and more important you understand actually what you're putting in and what's going to the FCA is right. Um, so that, that sort of comes in as your role within the FCA, the environment, what they're doing, um, illustrating how you actually do the reporting, um, showing how it's changed. I think that's that's very important on its own right. Um, and finally, how we can help, you know, what we can do. We have BAT, we have IFAC and everyone. Yes, yes, we know you use BAT and all that. And, and to an extent, um, the reason we ask you to use it and recommend it is because it's actually built to help us do reporting. At one stage, the FCA had a system called Gabriel, which we had just got around to semi-automating sending returns. They uh, they then replaced that, of course, and the new system, Reg Data, is not capable of that. So we're back to having to do manual sub submissions because although they do have XML uploads, you have to go into each individual return to do that. By the time you've done that, you can probably do it faster for yourself. Um, so. We are covering a lot today. Um, we're also looking at what threats the, 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 this might uh, show to your companies. Um, quite often people think, oh, it's, you know, it's only returns, only if I'm actually doing anything wrong does it matter. But there are areas where they're, they're cross-checking and that, that really is what we're gonna discuss today, hopefully. Right, so what does the FCA think of you? Well, um, I actually read their beautiful document and um, it's pretty much they think that you can't do anything. Um, th this is increasingly their mentality. The FCA seem to think that you are no longer adults and that you're adolescents. So while they'll let you fill in the return, they're going to be checking it and they will be cross-checking it. Um, it's kind of like you're at that level where you're just taking dad's car for a drive. Now, in fairness to that, I rearrange my dad's front end so perhaps there is justification for what they're doing um it's very important to understand why they're doing this and why it's happened i think over the last two years the fda have been hit with massive amount of verbs going bust um, on the back of that the fscs is paying out more than it's ever paid claims are coming in more there's more lawyers dedicated to getting money out of you guys and your insurance um, all of this means that they need to get a tighter rein on what you're doing and that you have a control of your company and that you're in a position to pay off the minimum requirements should you decide to close or go bust. I don't think many decide to go bust, but nevertheless, it does happen. <laughs> right. So I'll go through what they think you, do, you don't know and don't understand. Um, at the top, intangible assets, well, that's no surprise, and that's because it's an argument between accountants and the FCA. Accountants are within their own rights to say that intangible assets are in fact an asset, whereas the FCA say if you went bust today, you couldn't get them and therefore they're not an asset. Um, that's not altogether true, because if you're going to sell, say, your uh, your book, that is an asset in its own right, you'll get money for it. So even gone bust, you could transfer that to someone else who would give you money. But it's very important to understand that the FCA don't see that because they don't appreciate you selling your book. Right. 
recoverables and readily realizable debtors. This is a small subtle area. As I said, it's a bit more interactive. Um, they're increasingly asked that if you're putting stuff in that you've reviewed it and that you understand what it requires. So in this area, a debtor um, is really someone who owes you money but has the capacity to pay you. Um, the important thing is there's no point putting debtors in if they're actually in arrears or they're not in a position to pay you. Um, it may be better to say that what they refer to debtors as people who have not paid yet rather than people who are in distress or not in a position to pay. Likewise with liabilities, quite often you'll see that people uh, cross over between a year and say uh, 15 months. So their accounting includes it within their liabilities for the year, but in fact, it has to be paid in 15 months. It's a very clear defined structure within the FCA and how they're doing their reporting. So that you need to make sure that anything that's going into your current liabilities is within a year and to the company only. It can't be debt, say to directors or, or sole traders. Uh, it will be, but that's in a different structure. Right. Um, again, we talked about theoretical assets. Well, the FCA have, have nailed it down to people saying that the material post balance sheets don't actually show what's going to happen in the company. Well, no surprise, a balance sheet is a on the day um, utensil. So on that day, your company will be like that. You, what they're saying is that if you anticipate and know of a material change to your capital adequacy or your uh, cash or liquidity, then you're now in a position where you should almost be reporting that to them on the day you know about it, or at least in the report where you know about it. So if it's happening in three months, you know that you're gonna be changing your shareholders or someone's pulling out, you kind of have to put that in your reporting and you should under principle 11 have told the FCA that you've got a material issue coming up. So that's really where they're, they're wanting to see that you're more interactive, that you're giving a not only a, a moment's view, but also six months view as well. Um, no one's understand the profit and loss reporting. That's not difficult to understand, really, because the FCA um, put two to three to six types of dates in it, where really all you have to know is your profit and loss needs to match up to your balance sheet. Your balance sheet is as of the day, so your balance sheet runs from the start of your year to that date. So very simply, your profit and loss is year to date. OK, another area where the FCA have raised an issue that never been raised before would be that you're not actually estimating what tax you're going to pay. So again, this is a very subtle way. The, the FCA are interacting a lot more with HMRC. But this also relates to you estimating your capital adequacy. So if you're saying I'm not going to pay a, a dividend or that I'm not going to pay tax in the year six months in, um, then you can use all that money as potential assets. However, you are not then taking into account that you might have to pay tax or you're going to pay a dividend. And so your capital adequacy is going to reduce. So really, they want you to understand that. And that introduces the next topic, which nobody seems to be able to get a hand on it because the FCA have at least four types of working it out, and that's capital adequacy. Firstly, cash does not equal capital, capital adequacy. We'd like to say that £200,000 in the bank, so I don't have a problem, but if you've got £300,000 debt, you do. Um, the FCA are working on a principle that you have sufficient money to cover a minimum amount of regulatory activities sort of paying your PI excess, something along those lines, even if you went bust today. So in that point, your company has to be trading with a asset uh, positivity, which most companies are not really required to, and a lot of companies using tangible assets to cover the, the actual loss. You can't do that with the, the FCA. Um, they're saying that you're not checking your capital adequacy every day. Now, I don't know who can, <laughs> that's motivation to do that. Um, I think most what they're really saying is that you should have sufficient capital adequacy that you only need to be checking it, um, say, once a month or quarterly. But you also have to take that into account should you have an event which knocks your company for a six. 
So it's very much a case that no, you don't have to check it every day if your capital attitude is okay. But if you're about five, you know, five to ten percent above, any material activity may actually influence that. And so that's very much something you need to keep in your mind. Can I just ask you a question? Yeah. So on the bullet point, you've put cash equals capital requirement. But you, yeah, you, so what, what they said saying was it is, doesn't. Well, that, that's why they say your understanding isn't. So you. Because when we're um, what I would doing say is new That's appetite. how they said it. They said cash equals capital requirement. No, it doesn't. So, yeah, because I see know, that. That's what um, they're saying. When they say you are making that mistake, you're saying that I've got sufficient capital and therefore uh, cash, then I've got sufficient capital. That isn't the case. It's right, um, so, interesting to see that because when, when you do uh, new applications, the, the uh, auth new authorization team in, invariably say, um, show us your bank statement. <laughs> <laughs> they do yeah which doesn't exactly yeah. uh, isn't exactly capital adequacy but it's exactly what you put there which is but they'll also be checking effectively your, saying cash does it shares. capital but yeah yeah but they'll also be checking say company's house to see the value of shares and that the paid up shares nowadays they never used to do that they do that now um so yes it is a case that you have to take very basically assets minus intangible uh assets uh Minus liabilities, is assets minus liabilities, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. Everything you got minus everything you owe. Um, they're also looking at subordinated loans because a lot of people have them as capital adequacy, the sort of quasi capital, but they don't know how to use them. So they don't have a contractual agreement in place. They're not using the structure that the FCA have put in place, which is a legal document about 40,000 years old. Um, and very obscure but nevertheless you have to have that in place the other side of it is that whilst you can have a subordinated loan there is a clause within it that you can't have more than four times your other assets so if you've got 200 pounds or 100 pounds of other assets you can only have 400 pounds worth of subordinate loan counting towards your capital adequacy um pi well i think that's an area that everyone will just groan about um for the fca the the area they're looking again comes to capital adequacy because PIs, excess and exclusions are quite often not taken into account. Finally, you don't do your data right because sometimes they use thousands and sometimes they use one unit. Sometimes on some reports they're doing thousands and on some others they're doing exact. You just have to read the top of the report to tell what type of unit you're using. So if you're in doubt, either ask us or look at the top of the report where it shows you. Okay, so where the FCA focus? Well, nothing's changed on that. Um, they still focus on your accounts. As Charlie said, when you first do the application, they wanna look at your cash balance account and they wanna look at your accounts. So that hasn't changed. And it's, if anything, getting more complicated in that they're wanting more and more details about your cash. For example, in ICARA these days, there's a new MIFID 8 report where they're actually asking what you pay your advisors, what bonuses they get, whether they're discretionary or not. There's thousands of, you know, new returns which uh, boggle the mind. I never thought you'd have to actually declare to the FCA how much you're paying an advisor or yourself for that matter. <laughs> I think it's a bit personal. Nevertheless, um, we will carry on. So in terms of your balance sheet, what they're really looking at, again, is that you're, you've not only got uh, capital adequacy, but you've got liquidity. So whereas before you just did a balance sheet, you put it in, and as long as your capital and reserves met the FCA requirement, that was it. Nowadays, most of you are having to do quarterly liquidity re returns. So if they don't add up to what you're doing in your six monthly or your quarterly, or some of you, it's monthly returns, then they're going to ask a question. So whereas they're look independent things, that's obviously if your liquidity isn't meet, meeting the requirement and then you do your ICAR reporting and you say it is, there's a difference. And then that's increasingly how they're, they're, they're focusing is that they're trying to trip you up or at least discover whether you're actually telling the truth or not. 
The biggest area, therefore, comes down to RMAD, which is capital adequacy, um, where they're making sure that not only have you got um, capital adequacy nowadays, but in terms of investment firms, they're also looking whether you've got liquidity. Um, they're even asking this in applications now. And that is because to an extent, the FCA have just changed their way of thinking. You guys are now lucky. You're part of the in crowd. Those people trying to get in must be as good as you or better. Likewise, on the downside of that, the FCA are saying, well, if you're not good enough, we will kick you out. So it's a real change in mentality where they were just taking everyone in and everyone needed to be regulated. They're now going, no, we're going to keep the ones we can regulate. We've got the numbers. We've got the staff. That's what we're going to do. So to get in now is a lot more difficult, which means your license is worth more money. Quite frankly, someone can buy it still. You can transfer it into their name and it's a lot quicker process than applying. Uh, you're more likely to get approved too. So that's where the SCA are focusing. They're also looking at other areas. So that whereas before you'd do two returns twice a year, nowadays some are facing 30 returns. That includes looking at DB pensions, um, uh, a big area for them at the moment. They've even created a specific report just to look at British Steel. Um, no coincidence that that's shortened to BS. Um, I think everyone's sick of it by now. <laughs> Nevertheless, that's now a new report we're having to go through. Again, anything that's new, you can always ask us. Um, if your interpretation is different to ours, you can also ask us. Um, the final area, you know, um, Mifid and ICOR. The tickets are going to sell out in the next half hour. Mifid and ICARA is coming to um, all areas of finance. So whereas before it was the top echelon of what they're expecting, that's dropping down now to mortgages. It's dropping down even to insurance where they're saying, well, you need to keep the same requirements that we want for them. So again, you're beginning to having to do annual reviews like you do for investments, even if you're an insurer. Um, these, all, these changes are subtle, but you'll see them falling down. And where you really see them is when oh, they add right. another four returns that you have to do. It's now, granted, most of those returns related to um, areas where you were doing over, say, 3,000 policies and £400,000 worth of insurance. Most of the mortgage guys will say, well, that's not me. Um, it also looks at whether you're actually charging anything additional on top of your commission. Now, again, 80 to 90% of people, that's not going to be impertinent. But if it is, then you have to do a great deal more return. So, you know, you're having to look at all your clients over the last 10 or more years in order to get the information for it. So it's a build up, a real build up of information about you. Um, There's a right. question from... Um, Will so directors loan be considered as part of capital adding or just as a liability? No, it is. As I said, you may use director's mm. loan as a capital adequacy, but you can only use um, the amount of your director's loan that assets minus oh. liabilities you have other than it. So you, you have to be, basically take, right, my assets are £20,000. Um, you know, including, say, retained profits, mm. uh, profit and loss account and shares. So I can have four times that representative of a subordinate loan however that reduces as your assets reduce so if you're using I, that I instead of that. assets you can't the 881-90301 yeah. yeah yes well, while we're um doing that i'm trying to find the button on uh, uh, zoom fine. where you remove a participant it's yeah. in here somewhere and <laughs> i'm just looking for it <laughs> Get going, Alistair. Right. What to focus on? Well, <laughs> yes. It's very difficult these days to, to know what they're looking for. Um, the first thing is get your returns on time. I think increasingly um, the £250 that they charge you for each return is not the important bit. The important bit is that if you don't do your return, your company goes into a certain pile, which they then rise to a level that's a bit shall we say, more investigative. Charlie uses a very good phrase. You get put in the, your, your company suddenly goes in the front window, which means that anyone else investing in any other part of what you're doing will be looking at the fact that you missed a return. 
So whilst it's still expensive, 250 quid, it may be far more devastating to you because if you continually miss returns, the FCA then turn around and say, right, well, you're actually not fit and proper. You're not meeting your requirements. And then, then they're going to come and visit. The last thing you want. All we're trying to do, as best to do, is do an accurate report and make sure that the FCA don't see you. That's the biggest aim. Right. What to, to do this, I think a, a subtle change in mentality may be required. They're looking for you to be a bit more proactive. Um, they, they, they would expect that you have processes and monthly reviews nowadays for most firms, um, obviously mortgage and insurance, not so much, but certainly investments and pensions nowadays. Um, they would expect that you're, as a board, are looking at your, uh, your activities related to the returns, at least monthly, sometimes even more, depending on how, how high risk you are at the moment. So, you know, and, and that's really demonstrated for um, defined benefits advisors because of the amount of returns they're having to do. Um, they're doing the monthly nowadays. They're looking at the accounts monthly. They're looking at what you're trading and, it, you know, your regulated activity. So really, you have to be doing that too. Um, we can help. Um, certainly, BAT helps here. Um, the way we can work with BAT is that it has all the information that we need in order to do the returns. The only thing we don't have is your profit and loss, and you can chuck your login to zero QuickBooks, whatever at me, and I can even get that. So that will reduce a lot of the work you have to do if you're in BAT or your system that you, the back of office system you're using, is able to easily extract the information we need. So it may be a good idea to sit down and say, why, what do I need to do on, say, quarterly or semi-annually in order to pre-prepare the information I need to provide to Al? That may help you a lot, may not, depends how you work. Um, what they do want to see is that if you are doing these returns, that you're actually recording processes to submission so that they can see that you're actually um, reviewing it, you're looking at your data, you've had a discussion about it, you question areas, and that you've recorded what's happened in the submission. So if they were to come and say, well, why did you do this? You know, you can say, well, th these are the reasons. This is why I decided. Um, you know, like with everything these days with the FCA, you have to actually be able to prove that you did what you did because of the thinking you were doing. So very difficult, but it's fairly simple in so far as if you have any questions, come back to me and I can respond. Um, that communication enough is evidence that you're questioning areas about your returns. And that's important. That's what the FCA want to see. Most importantly, if you find something that isn't right, um, get on it. Whereas the FCA may not pick it up on that return. If it happens again, they will. So it's a case that if there is a problem, notate it, write it down, uh, work for a solution. Um, if it's something that's under principle 11 and you have to tell the FCA, try and tell them before the return, they don't like the idea that you send out a return and then tell them because what they would say then is you're actually trying to hide it and then principle 11 kicks into your fitness and propriety <laughs> and before you know it they're investigating you a lot harder um so if you do have a problem tell us we'll tell you how to uh how to deal with it whether you need to tell the fca or whether you can trade out of it or um it's not a big issue and we will just work around it whatever it is please tell us you know because we probably dealt with it um the other thing you can get from your, your uh, returns is because you've got so much information going through it, you can actually use it to see what trends are affecting your company. So the FCA use it to see what's affecting the industry. But for you, you can say, right, well, I can see, you know, that definitely insurance has gone up, mortgage has gone down, or that my, my payments have doubled or tripled or quadrupled. Have I done something about that in terms of compliance and structures like that? It's very much a case of saying, well, if I have to do this, well, you might as well use as the information as much as possible. Don't get complacent. More and more, the FCA are looking um, at you and what you do. So this information is important and maintained to be important. If there's inconsistencies, they will pick it up now. Um, as I say, they put a lot of money into the new system. It's probably rubbish on the front end, but on the back end, it's probably checking a lot more. It's a lot more AI and we'll be reviewing and looking for anywhere where there's inconsistencies. So 
If you're doing your returns, what I tend to do, I know your last return, I check it anyway. Um, it's not a bad idea you do that as well, because if there's any great gaps, you, you should be able to see them within what you're sending to the FCA, and they will as well. So it's kind of a way of preparing yourself if you do have problems. Um, you know, if you're looking like you're um, not going to be able to trade out of an issue or um, you haven't got the controls or staff in place or you've got massive turnover, all of those things they will pick up now, whereas before they didn't. So it's a case that you need to uh, be ahead of the FCA. And these returns really can give you that knowledge and practical heads up. This is coming your way. Um, so again, if you use them positively, maybe they're not the worst things in the world. Um, the other side of it is the FCA are now actively discussing with directors returns. So you may phone them up about something and then they'll ask, don't you think that's the same as this? And they'll refer it very tenuously to say your capital adequacy. If you don't know what you're talking at that stage, that immediately raises you right to the, the center um, of their understanding that you are not in control of your company. And that is quite a big area. Again, as I said, uh, while they're not telling you you're short of cash, it, it's important that you know that you're, you're beginning to get a bit tight. So this is where these returns are important in that you should actually, if you're not doing this proactively, they should be telling you that you there may be problems ahead. Um, so if you can look at it now, you, you can almost forecast what will happen. Um, in the next six months, which may help you be a bit more adaptable and change your structures. You may want to bring in uh, diversification or you may want to look for more liquidity or you may want to downsize or get rid of advisors or bring in advisors and supervisors. All of this can come from what you're doing on your RMAG, which is basically saying what advisors you've got. Lastly, I suppose what the FCA are doing with their surveys, you've seen them very well. The liquidity side of things matches up to uh, not only they're saying, well, your capital reserves, but we don't believe that as well. We want to know actually what's in your bank account, actually what you're going to receive. And whereas you say you might receive this, do you actually receive it? Well, the return will probably tell you that and vice versa. Um, if your liquidity return looks fine, yet your return does not. They're going to say, well, you're lying to us or you're not got a control of your company. There are other returns. I must admit, I call them stats for Pratt's. Um, most of the stuff is absolutely unimportant because it doesn't refer to your company. It refers to the FCA gathering information about the industry. Uh, the one area that is important are MHAs and fees because they're going to charge you and that's how much they get their profit line from. So it's very important that you understand that they're gathering general information here. They are using these a lot more proactively these days. They are looking at nowadays... Your advisors, for example, they're checking the SPS dates, they're beginning to um, review clawbacks, they're looking at um, whether you've got a high turnover, um, all of these things they're beginning to use, whereas before they were just something to say they did something, they're beginning to use it. They're, they're certainly sort of saying, well, um, are you actually doing this? Even the report that you do for your ARs now has become a bit more um, important because you now do a survey on it and the survey matches what you're saying in your return. So if you're not, if you're not telling the truth or you're not actively matching the two together, you may need to start thinking about that. Even as far as sort of an RMA uh, report eight where you're telling naughty advisors. Um, if you don't tell the FCA about someone you've disciplined um, and they find out and they will, um, then you're in a position where you haven't done the reporting and then they will investigate your whole senior management process. Let's say, well, if you didn't do this one, what else is in your, you know, what else is in your company that we don't know about? And, and that really is how these returns trigger things for the FCA is their confidence in you. As long as your returns are going through correctly, accurately, all the information's there, you're probably not ever going to have a discussion with the FCA about it. But there's certainly a trigger within these returns now, um, which more and more the FCA are in a position to do something about. How do we work? Well, I've already discussed this, I suppose. We have a massive amount of experience. You know, if you take Charlie into account, we're going back at least 10 years of doing these returns. Um, we do them day in, day out for 200 plus firms. 
um, as well as sort of consumer credit firms, which takes up nearly 600 firms. So we've got a great breadth of knowledge about a lot of returns, which may even, you know, it, they, they interreact on some level. So they help us understand it. And so we have that experience to draw on. We have a real depth of knowledge, um, you might say. The other side of it is we are actually on your side. If you want information, if you want to do a return in a certain way, you tell us. You will tell you the risks. That's our job is to say, this is what will happen. That may happen. This will happen. The important thing is that you tell us. Um, because as consultants, we don't necessarily have to go to the FTA. There's some areas, without doubt, if we think there's fraud, we would have to report it. But other than that, it's a discussion with you personally about what you're going to do with your company. So don't be afraid to come to us on that area. Um, we do ask questions. We give you information about it. We try to keep consistency within your returns. Um, we know how the FCA works, so we know where they're asking an open-ended question on some of the returns, which may not be that obvious to you. Um, so we, we, we try to give you a real big picture of what you're doing with your returns. And, and also we discuss and we're honest with you to say this area may need work on, this area the FCA may be uh, looking more at, you know, the surveys at the moment or what they call high growth or DB oversight. Um, they're basically looking at your accounts every month or every quarter for some of you. Um, in this, you just have to be very straight, honest, and make sure that reporting for them is exactly the same reporting that's going to the FCA. If you're not sure, ask us. We'll look at it. We, you know, we can review it for you. Um, we, we'd like to say that and hope that one and a half of my brain or half my brain is probably uh, better than just yours alone. So just looking at it, we're probably going to help you because you may not pick up what we can see. We've got the experience. Um, you may be too close to it to realize that you're not actually putting in the right details. And more importantly, we'll listen and offer solutions. We're not just here to say, right, put it in, send it on. Um, it's very important to us that you discuss and understand what you're doing. And if you've got a problem or you don't understand, we're here to listen and try and give you a, a solution. MCA likes and dislikes. Um, these are pretty much the same as we said, they want you to be actively monitoring your returns these days. You should have a review trail where you're showing uh, whether you're actually um, you're 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 doing you're just following what they want or whether you're actually checking your company. Um, that comes down to evidence of reasoning. If you've made a decision on something, you should be evidencing it and write it down as part of your your return. Um, as I said, consulting with us is, is a good sign that you're showing you being proactive to your return. So don't be afraid to send a question or ask something if you're not sure. Um, processes for reporting. Again, as I said, if you've got in the background, you've got a process which you do say two weeks before the return, it makes it a lot easier. Um, that also shows that you're being proactive towards what the FCA want. And that's what they want. They want anticipative reporting, that you're actually reviewing what they're putting as what they consider important to your firm. You know, at the end of the day, these returns are actually about what they're saying you need to do in order to meet their requirements. So if you're not doing the return or you're treating it as blase, um, that's going to show. And if they come in, they can look at it and use as evidence against you without a doubt, you know. Um, they want to improve on communication with you. They want you to talk to them more. That's not my um, my view. I think the best way you can do that is through us um, because the FCA are, are very good at taking information out, out of context. So my view is always say, give them what they want and no more. Um, internal reviews, they're, they're expecting that directors have an oversight of this, uh, depending on the risk of the company. This may be month by month, quarter by quarter or year by year. We recommend quarterly you should be looking at all these areas generally, unless you've got a high risk area or there's something wrong with your firm or you're trading right on the line. Accuracy, well, before they really didn't care. I'll be honest, there's been returns that have been done for 10 years and then two years ago, they turned around and said, this isn't being done right. So it's the first time they actually looked at returns forever, but they are now because they realize they don't have the staff to actively review every company and they're getting hit in the face every time with FSCS and that's embarrassing for you. And the FCA are more, more likely to take action because it's embarrassing than you're doing anything wrong. 
you know for them as far if they see all these companies that they're authorizing and regulating collapsing it's an embarrassment to them so this is why this is always coming through whereas before um they may have said oh it's okay more and more they're saying it's not okay because companies that report incorrectly or lazily tend to go bust and join the fscsq of payments uh lastly if you get your guesstimates must be more accurate if you're going to use them your managed accounts should include 80 percent of what's going to a uh, company's house if it doesn't they do look at it so your final account sent to them they will review those and while they're managed accounts they would expect that there's evidence of difference between your managed accounts to your final accounts if your final accounts go to company's house without capital adequacy they may well pick it up these days so that's something you need to have a chat with your accountants about it's very important um again if you do late returns you become aware to the fca um, if you demonstrate a lack of knowledge of the requirements or you don't have any records um, they're going to come down on you I mean these days it's not as simple as it used to be um, they're expecting that you have internal controls and checks that should raise issues to you about what they're looking at so um, they're they're asking a lot more senior members <laughs> let's put it that way okay um, timelines well it's very interesting the FCA work from January December but they they're they're using your um your financial year so there's a difference right at the start um it's very difficult especially with working out how you do your fees because they've got one period you've got another and the answer is a third um nevertheless um you can anticipate that the FCA use those two areas so they're either going to use a January to December or your financial year end most of it seems to now be driven by your financial year end so they're, they're hoping to align with what you're doing um they started out saying well you should do it the way we do it so secondly they're national you are probably some of you are certainly national but a lot of you are local that makes a difference you know you what you do for your clients is not the same as what they do over there um your clients may want certain things that others don't um all this kind of thing is is, is there's a break in timelines where they think that they can apply consistency across the board it's just not the case because people in london are not the same as people in glasgow or edinburgh or bradford or, or um you know cheltenham they're different and they have different requirements but the fca have to try and cover it all so what you're seeing nowadays is that what they do is massive overkill but you have to do it or they'll bring you up on it um the government seems to be more and more involved in this area they're trying desperately to get more money money out of everybody um and they're de very definitely looking downhill so you're at the bottom and you do what I say um is very definitely the attitude they've now taken that changed from when they started where they were working with us don't misconstrue nowadays they're telling you what to do um certainly we've been there forever we'll be there forever hopefully um we serve national sometimes even international as we have advisors that are abroad <laughs> most of the time um we're very much individualistic though because we're not a big company we do try to really give you a personal service the FCA can't give you a personal service um you know you guys you're all about personal and popular and what you need to meet requirements but the FCA is very much a flat this is how you do it and we can't really adjust so don't expect in return for them to say yeah it's fine you can do it that way it's a case that if you don't do it the way they do it then you must be able to justify why you don't okay so we'll start with the basics of reg data as you can see um within this we've got your change of firm reporting schedule submission and all those to be honest the only areas you will probably be using is reporting schedule or submission history if you want to find out submissions you've done in the past you go to submission history um, below that you can see that you can a handbook reference and it's a select handbook reference well that will tell you what type of report so if you type in rma-a it'll come up you click it and then you can choose uh the dates you want or all of them and then you say find and that way you can find any return you've done in the past um, otherwise you have to scroll through every single one of them and click in and out it's laborious the system's rubbish um 
Likewise, if you want to adjust anyone's uh, permissions, ourselves included, or uh, you want to uh, give or take away permissions, you have to do that in the firm and user se section. So you go to firm and user, user administration manager, you can either add someone or you can um, uh, adjust what they've got. What's very important for us is that we have at least firm level admin and that all boxes are ticked. And the, re the reason we say this, that if you are principal, um, if they add a new return, for example, we don't know about it. Unless you actually tick the box, we don't know about it and can't see it and can't get into it. So it's very much a case that if anything new comes out in this and you're the principal, you need to kind of tell us. Now we'll pick it up usually because we've got other people and we are principals ourselves. Um, however, just in case, make sure that that's always up to date for our login. Um, if you ever leave us, don't forget to delete us out as well. Right, a big topic, capital adequacy. I'm starting by saying that there's a generalistic way of doing this rather than looking at what the FCA asks, because there are three, three to four types of doing capital adequacy for the FCA. It's very important to just cover what we're talking about. And what the FCA think capital adequacy is, if you went bust today, could you pay your excess on your PI? That's really what it comes down to. So consumer, what they're trying to do by doing capital adequacy and PI is ensure that the consumer is protected, that you've got the PI to pay a claim and that you can cover the excess so a consumer is not adversely uh, affected if you went bust today. Um, it's also there to say, can you take a punch in the face? You know, if your company loses two of its three advisors, are you in a position to continue to carry on? Um, and if not, are you able to then um, slowly and methodically liquidate rather than crash and burn? All of these things are kind of built in. There's a, a requirement for the FCA to say, are you a genuine firm? Are you a genuine firm or are you just looking to trade and then throw away? Um, they want genuine firms now. They want to see that your, capital, your, your adequacy is in a position where you're fairly positive. Now, people buying firms in IFA structures quite often buy books. They don't buy the firm. But what the a firm trading that way would tell you is that they're probably a lot more regulated than one that's not and, and running right on the edge. It's difficult nowadays to run your company right on the edge as <laughs> supply versus demand says that's the way you should do it, but regulation always comes in between there. So you do need to have that balance. The FCA are looking at it and every single firm, they're wanting to see that there's some positivity about your capital, that it's liquid, liquidable, that it's real, and that yes, you may be facing a little bit of tax on it, but compared to the, the issues you'll have if you ever breach this one area, it'll be nothing. Um, recently, they've also looked at what you call assets. So before you used to say this is assets and they were happy with that. Um, nowadays, less so. They want to know that you're reviewing it and that those assets are indeed liquid. Right. So for non-MIFID firms, capital adequacy comes down to two main areas. I suppose it's your F FCA uh, minimum requirements and then PI excesses and exclusions. Um, so if you're, and, and obviously you're trading turnover. If you're Turnover starts to become over, say, 400,000. That then becomes your minimum because uh, as an investment firm, that's more than 5%. And so that then is your minimum. So as you get bigger, your capital adequacy requires to be more. And that's based on the fact that the FCA predict that if you went bust today, you would need to pay a certain amount of excesses. So they think um, up to 400,000 pounds, you're going to pay four claims. I don't know how they work that out. I really don't. <laughs> um, what is important is you, you understand the excesses and the exclusions. So, again, I've seen a lot more PI companies are excluding things. They're doing this because it makes it cost effective to the advisor. If you're no longer doing DBS, you need to exclude it. But if you've done DBS, you still need to be able to cover that. So, then you start going into a whole, a very difficult area because exclusions specifically for DB are, are, are huge. And what they really say, they have a table of it, they say 12,000 pounds, but they say, you've got to work out 
what possible claims you might have, the value of those claims, and that's what you have to self-insure with. So it's almost self-insurance. Right. The second side of it, MIFID, MIFID firms, investment firms, um, things have changed, certainly in that area. So we'll go through that. Um, the, if you fall foul of being an SN, uh, not being an SNI, sort of a, a small non non controlled uh, insurance, uh, then you're going to need more and more uh, capital adequacy. The, the important thing here is ICARA has taken over for all investments, including by proof firms. So where before you may have said fifty thousand euros, not longer the case. Nowadays you're needing at least seventy five. Some of you are hundred and twenty five. Um, and there's more reviews that you need to do. You now got to look at your fixed costs. You've got to look at the liquidity of assets. And if you fall out of SNI, then you start having to do K-factor risk reviews with complicated formulas that the FCA have provided. Um, it can get very messy very easily. I'll start with the normal ones. So you all know these kind of uh, displays. Um, the RMAD breaks it into two areas, which is your insurance and mortgage and your investments. So your insurance and mortgage, well, that's standard of about 5,000, um, unless your trading goes at 2.5% of turnover goes over that five grand, then you need to be having that. Now, to be clear, if you hold client money, um, then your base amount is 10,000 and your 5% and of annual income or 5% of annual income. Um, there are other ads. Um, recently, they've created a table to uh, add additional capital requirements for insurance and mortgage if your excess is over 2,500. So this has always been the case, but they've actually now said, right. So in this case, if you... Um, if, if your excess is over two and a half thousand and some advisors, they just have a blanket 5,000. Now, never before, but nowadays you should speak to your insurance companies to state clearly in your, um, in your schedule and agreement that mortgage and insurance should be less than 2,500. Otherwise, you're going to have to have additional capital adequacy. Exactly the same with pension and investments. That starts out as two thousand pounds as a non mifid twenty thousand pounds as a non mifid firm, uh, or five percent of your turnover. Again, if you've got exclusions or excess over five thousand, then you need additional capital. Um, that is very much the basics on on that level. So here are the tables, and as you can see on the left is your insurance, and on your right is investments. Um, strangely enough, if you start from naught to four <laughs> to, to uh, three hundred thousand then you, you do actually need to have capital excess capital adequacy at five. You don't if you're trading over that. And that's because they think that you'll have sufficient capital in the company. So you'll notice it goes down. It's not the case in terms of investments. Uh, you'll find as you go across the line, um, so your um, total amount of excess uh, goes from left to right. <laughs> Um, so the increase required gets more and more. And this is specific to your regulated, not your unregulated income. And it's a, it's to the particular product as well. So this can get very convoluted, especially if, say, you used to do DB, um, but you don't anymore, but you still need to calculate what your extra you need for cover. Um, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, what's the source of that table? Uh, the FCA. That's if you actually uh, dig in. Am I right in enough. thinking that's in IPRU? Yes. Dash investments. Well, dash one of them is 13. the investment is that the mortgage one isn't. I can't remember where I actually got that. Okay. Um, it's been pretty okay. recent. I'll find out, Charlie, and 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 send out. Um, right. So, how your capital is calculated is actually your reserves area. So your capital reserves which should equal your assets minus liabilities figure. Um, but you will see here that they do take out intangible assets. They take out investments in own shares, uh, you, any losses you may make. Um, so it is a case that whilst you can take all your assets, you have to take out the, the areas that they say you need to take out. Right. So now we come to ICARA. Um, this is increasing the investments and pensions firms, uh, not yet mortgages, so you don't need to worry about this too much. 
Um, okay. The first Can thing I ask you a question? Is where the... Yes. Sorry, just because um, we're, well, we build this as finishing at 11 o'clock, four minutes time. If, if I'm right, if I remember your second slide or something, this is, we're sort of 75%. Really there, Charlie. <laughs> okay, so uh, what... we, we won't have many much time for the, uh, the, the questions, but let me finish this off as one of the areas that everyone needs to know about. Okay. Okay, so as uh, Icora firm, you, you, you're you either a small non-interconnected firm or you're not. Um, below lists exactly what you need in order to say um, you are. And ideally that's where you wanna be because then you're only looking at uh, the requirement 75,000 pounds or your fixed costs, a quarter of your fixed costs. Um, if you're not, then uh, you have to go, okay, that, I don't need that really. Then you start having to do your pay calculations. You have to fill all these, work it out and do your risk parameters a lot more. So if you are actually falling out of an SS, SNI and you need to do a review as part of an ICAR and firm, um, then you need to start putting all of these in. So you need to tell us that you are actually not an SNI. We don't know ourselves. Um, they look at liquid assets nowadays. They also say um, a third of your liquid assets is a minimum requirement in terms of liquidity. Um, they do let you have non-core liquid assets or semi-liquid assets, but they give it a, a healthy haircut of 50%. So it is a balance of saying, right, well, these are my fixed assets. These are my fixed costs. Um, this is my liquidity. Um, this is realistically what it is, should I take away some of the things that are not as liquid as they should be. So it is now a calculation more than ever before. Um, so yeah, and so now we there are other returns that we do. I'll briefly lift them quickly. This is for SMMCR, so your report eight, which we discussed. Any advisor who breaches FCA rules or is disciplined by yourself, it's always recommended that you do this report when you tell the FCA. Um, again, you've got your balance sheets. You've seen all these profit and loss, your regulated information. All of it is broken down. The FCA now use this to find out your gross and your net. So they're looking at ARs like they've never before. Um, they also want to know that most of your firm fees are now coming from charges rather than commission. So there's no place now for trail. There just is no place for it. You need to restructure in order to include it. So a lot of your investments and pensions should now be in the fees and advisor charges because that's an annual charge. Even if you receive it as a commission of the assets, as long as it's an annual charge, it's a charge. Complaints as well, we can go through those, you know them very well. Uh, the only area here we really need to focus on is to ensure that you are putting in only the complaints that you've opened. Um, you will, you will, in three, you put those that are already open. In four, you'll tell them the new ones. Um, they have a table at the bottom where you put in your complaint closure, um, upheld, and how much it cost. That's only when you've actually finished it off. So you don't do that for open. Um, likewise, if you've had a lot of complaints and you want to justi justify it against um, how much you're actually dealing, then you also need to do the contextualization metrics, which looks at how much you've done in the period and how much you've ever done. So if you get 40 complaints, but you've done 2000 in the period, it's a small percentage. So this is telling the FCA, if you need to, that whilst you've had a lot of complaints in this period, they're not relative to how many you've actually done. Um, RMAK just looks at your charges. This is more important these days because the FCA are looking at contingent versus non-contingent charging. Again, this will show if you're doing an ongoing fee, then it's more likely most of your income should be there. If it's coming in any other way, um, or um, that it looks as though you're doing uh, one-offs totally, then they will question it. Likewise, if you have no one-offs, they'll also question it to say, well, why not? Are you not doing sort of um, ad hoc top ups uh, for clients? They also, as part of that, they also get all your fees. So you need to tell us how you're charging uh, your initial charges and percentages, as well as your ongoing and uh, the areas. Uh, don't really need to discuss that one. The insurance terms very obvious. 
Um, this area, I think we have a brief discussion because it's changed. Um, you need to be more accurate on these areas these days. They want to know how many advisors, how many supervisors, because this will show whether you got enough people in place um, over your advisors. If you've got 90 advisors and one supervisor, they'll pick it up. So it's important, and this can then tell you as well, if you grow fast, sometimes directors don't even know they've got 10 advisors, no supervisors. Um, it's very much a case that this is now more an interactive. Um, again, they're looking at clawbacks. They're looking how many and how much, um, because it's, it's an area that they want to know about now. Um, finally, they'll, the new return that we've got, a financial crime levy, this is either your 2022, if your um, year end is after March, or 2023 information, and it's all your turnover for your firm. This isn't for the FCA, it's for the, uh, the, the government, because they're going to charge you if you've got a turnover over 10.2 million. So I don't think it'll affect that many. GI measures, largely a waste of time. If you want to discuss those with me, happy to go through them. But 99% of you, it, this just does not affect. Um, and I think we can leave it at that end. I think um, nowadays we can, we can say, well, we've covered what we need to cover. And do you have any sort of material questions at, 